Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruit and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in a live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Jen Bender Shetler. Um, Jen is currently the Director of Global Engagement at Goshen College in Northern Indiana, directing the Immersive Intercultural Global Education Program, SST, that is required for all students. She spent 20 years in the History Department teaching world history, particularly Africa and the developing world. Her research is on oral tradition, social identity, and memory in the Mara region, Tanzania, and with PhD dissertation work going back to 1995. She has published two monographs and three edited collections from this research, in addition to a number of journal articles. Before teaching, she worked 11 years for a Mennonite Central Committee doing community development in Ethiopia, the Congo, and Tanzania. She's currently in the process of creating the Mara Cultural Heritage Digital Library through a three-year grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. This makes primary sources from her research in the Mara region, including audio, video, text, and visual, available to people in the region as well as scholars anywhere in the world. That is the subject of the talk today. So please join me in welcoming Jen as she gives her talk, Building and Introducing the Mara Cultural Heritage Digital Library. I'm, I am so happy to be there and to be part of this and to, um, to have some conversation. So I really encourage you to think about questions and just, uh, yeah, discussion that we can have. And I think we'll do that in the end, but you can certainly put things in the chat as we go along. Um, so I wanna to talk to you about my current three-year project to build and then introduce and disseminate the Mara Cultural Heritage Digital Library which you, you can find on at maraculturalheritage.org. And I hope you can get on there and look around and, and see what you think. So I, I look forward to, to this conversation. Uh, there we go. Okay, so um, this, this whole project gets started with me thinking about the ethical issues around oral history research, where we go to a place we make recordings, we talk to people, and then we take those recordings home. And in my case, you know, I had a whole stash of uh, old cassette tapes sitting in my um, in my office. And people, when I would go back to the Mara region, would would really want to know, would want to hear, would want to experience those interviews that I did, especially as time went on and those people I interviewed had passed on and their families wanted access to those. Um, so, so I started thinking about how to do this. And I think there's a number of issues involved here. One is just open access for scholars that, um, you know, other things are, are in historical research are in archives and oral history doesn't always make it to the archives. I think especially for young Tanzanian scholars to, to have some kind of an archive of accessible material that, that they can start working on. And then there's the much bigger issue of the repatriation of cultural heritage. So these, uh, these interviews that I did starting in 1995, many of those elders have passed on now. And, and, and I am the one that possesses that. So how do I return you know, the whole movement um, within museums and artifacts and other things about returning to the communities that generated these artifacts. And so the same is true for oral history research. And then simply, um, I mean, I've heard a lot from people in the Mara about the importance of passing on to the next generation. And, and as I'm thinking about it, um, young people are, are surprisingly really interested in these things. So back in 2017, I wrote an article in an open access journal called Searching for Sharing Heritage and Multimedia in Africa, where I talked about uh, the Mara Cultural Heritage Digital Library at that point was in this prototype stage and trying to think what are the implications of digital return of oral tradition? Like, what does that mean? And so I would love to have some conversation at the end about, 
about that. So this was a, a pre um, the grant that I now have um, and sort of saying that it really needed a, a larger platform to go to. Um, so in just a little bit on the history of building the Mara Cultural Heritage Digital Library, I have had, yeah, since 2000 maybe, um, students digitizing and transcribing, a lot of transcribing, um, the the my materials from different iterations of research and then in 2013 a student uh, research a summer research project got started in which we looked at the greenstone platform as a um as a way to stage this and so this greenstone platform website was sort of our 1.0 version where we put some really some minimal stuff on the web, tried to think about how to do that. Um, it was supported by a Goshen College server, and which was constantly down and not working. <laughs> and so through by but by having this prototype up, I was able to do some grant applications, some smaller things through the embassy and through other places, which never worked out. Um, never came through. And so it was all just through um, Goshen College, uh, small grants to keep going with this. So then in 2019 and 2020, the first year I applied for it, it was denied. And the second year I got it and it started in 2021. But um, as I started thinking about what platform to migrate this to and to really build, um, I made a connection with Michigan State University and their matrix project. And they said, well, if you get a, an NEH grant for this, then we'd love to work with you. And so I worked on that and finally got that. So I'm now at the end of the first year of a three-year grant. And the whole point of the grant is to do the website design and construction that Michigan State University's matrix project is doing for me. And um, they have a, a their, their metadata platform in the background is called Cora. So we've trained um, assistants who are digitizing and adding the metadata, um, working on it on the back end. And what's the wonderful thing about this is that even once it's, you know, even once Michigan State isn't really directly involved anymore, I can continue to go to Cora into the future and, and update and add and edit from it. It will, it's now in the process of being put onto the Africa Online Digital Library. So it will be one collection in that collection of African websites. I have um, somebody from the Mar region working on transcriptions. Uh, Tim Roth is working with me as a language consultant who had worked with Mara languages. I have an administrative assistant who um, works on the organizing and financial aspects. And the grant also pays for trips to Tanzania. So the first year or the first summer I didn't go because of COVID. Um, but but in July went, and I'll say more about that. Um, in the grant is uh, the ability to work with the Ministry of Education, some some funds for that, and some limited funds to do a few computer stations in the Mara region, and some publicity. And this, what you see on the screen, is a flyer that I. It's kind of like a half sheet flyer that I took with me this summer uh, to give out to people and institutions, it's got a, it's got a QR code so that you could, um, you know, go directly to it. And the website is uh, accessible on a cell phone. And so this, you know, people could go directly to this and also just soliciting uh, responses from people um, by giving out my information and yeah, asking for feedback. Um, so, through this NEH grant, the maraculturalheritage.org website went live in June, which was really fantastically exciting to actually see from, you know, just 10, 20 years of work on this to, to finally see it live. So it was really exciting. And the, the card, the, the illustration on this page shows that the 
card that I was also giving out to, with a QR code and also trying to um, get people to give me some feedback. Interestingly, the rock formation there, um, almost every person I talked to uh, said they knew where it was and they each had a different place where they thought it was. Um, so the basic thing that's on this website are, inter are my own interviews in 1995, 96, which were my, um, my dissertation uh, interviews. And there's hundreds of those. And then there are more limited ones from 2003, 2008, and 2010. In 2003 and 2008, we shot some video and um, those started to be everything. By the time we got to 2010, everything's kind of born digital, but especially 95, 96, and some of the 2003 um, are, were not digitized. Um, so they have audio, video, um, photographs, transcriptions, field notes. And so if you go on to the site, um, this is our, our cover page. Um, where you can learn more about the project and it has a little bit of the browsing and a few featured ones that we're gonna try to change in and out, but they're ones from uh, 95, 96, um, 2003 and 2007, and some of the uh, cultural sites that we were visiting. Um, if you go on to the browsing, you know, there's places to look for, for for interviews that are particularly about cultural sites or our cultural performances. Um, but because of the language interest, you know, you can go on here and, and also choose a language that you want to, to look at. And, um, and from these, I'll pick one of these randomly. You can see there's, there's a picture of the person in the interview. There are the audio files here along the side. Um, and a lot of the, the metadata here about a description. Um, sometimes there's a uh, biography, some of the keywords. Oh, here's the biography here, uh, the transcript, and you can download the transcript or you can show it right here online. Um, there are some field notes, which were kind of my, my field notes. Those are in English, everything else is in some combination of uh, Swahili and local languages. So, so that's kind of, uh, of an overview of what we're looking at. Um, there's also, and I can switch back to that, um, if you go into browsing, um, you can look up maps. So there's a, there's a number of maps, ones that, that I made or had made from my own research, but also ones that I had uh, from the Tanzania National Archives and other places. Um, there's, there's also uh, quite a few documents. Uh, and again, some of those are documents that I created, but there's also ones like local uh, historians who wrote, you know, the history of the Waisenye tribe. Um, there's also linguistic uh, things here like uh, word lists. And uh, here, here's a, a wildlife management document. There's, in, you know, here's Ingarime histories that were written. And then um, here are oral histories trans translated into both Swahili and, um, and English. And those were Luo language documents from CISO. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so you can, you can browse on those different things. In the resources, these are more like essays. So there's something that I wrote on the historical context of the Mara region. Um, there's a little video that we did one year on the peoples of Western Serengeti. There's some linguistic information here as well. So those are some of the things that you can see there, um, both things directly from my research and also from local people who have written histories and dictionaries and done word lists and all kinds of other things. And we continue to 
uh, collect those. Um, this next year, we're going to try to get in in touch with, um, like already in touch with the East Africana Library at the University of Dar es Salaam, the Nyerere Library. Um, the East Africa Literature Bureau and Donda Press, the Marino Language School, other places that have kind of out of print or archived materials that they might be willing to digitize and share with us. Uh, we'll also be working on the CISO collection, which um, is a man, a local kind of popular historian in the Mara region, um, mainly in Luo speaking areas. And since 1977, he was uh, doing oral interviews by audio. He did some transcripts, some translations, and has some photos. But were, I brought back with me this time uh, hundreds of his cassette tapes that we're trying to work with and see what we can get out of them. Um, the East Africana Library and the Nyerere Library have talked about giving us source lists that we could post and then people could, uh, you know, contact them. The last group of interviews I did, which are not all up now, were 2010 Women's Histories, um, which were much more personal. And so when I was back this summer, I was uh, getting permissions to, to post those, which I think we have now. And so we'll put those up. In 2007, uh, 2003 and 2010, we have, um, our seven, we have video. So a lot of them have great videos that people really enjoy. Um, uh, I don't know if you notice it, but there is a Swahili interface, at least for the browsing. Um, that's all we could do at this moment. It would be nice to be able to do a complete uh, Swahili side, but that's not in place. Um, there are all of the Bantu languages in the Mara region. Well, not all of them, but many of them are, are um, represented here, uh, as well as Dadog and um, Luo. So there's a whole range of things there. I showed you some of the browsing. And then um, we'll be adding more of these cultural performances and cultural sites, visits to cultural sites that was really part of my research. Okay, so that's kind of building it. And then the big thing now is um, how to introduce it and, and how to get people to start uh, looking at it. So when it came out in June, I started um, just going through my own social media, sending out emails to people that I had been in contact before, both academic connections and Tanzanian connections, and then took this trip in July, which I want to just do a quick run through that, um, sort of how, how I was introducing it and the kind of reactions I got. And just to kind of preface that by saying it was just an absolute joy to go back and do that. And people were so happy about it. And um, just we had a really good time looking at it. So just to say that I had done some earlier work, um, like this book, Telling Our Own Stories, is a collection of locally written popular histories from different places in the Mara region. And Brill published that first, but then I um, had um, Kuki Nanyota uh, through Walter Bogoya in Tanzania. It is published in Tanzania. It's hard to get it other than in Dar es Salaam. But, and people like this book and, and like getting access to it. But again, it's a very limited audience and it's expensive to buy. And so the website was trying to get out more of these things to, um, that everybody could have access to. So in Dar es Salaam, one of the things that I did was go to the history department at the University of Dar es Salaam and talk with the East Africana Library uh, interim director. Um, and there are at least two professors in the history department who have research in the Mara region. And so we talked about how they, would, how they could use it for history students and how we could partner with the East Africana Library maybe in the future to do some digitizing through them. Um, also in the Mar region, I got a connection with uh, the regional education officer in the Ministry of Education. And these are uh, two 
two people in the department, not Benjamin Oganga. And they were very excited about this. And there's the possibility that next summer that they would put together workshops with history teachers from the schools. And I would work with history teachers to develop some uh, lesson plans and other ways that, that it could be used in the schools. Um, I've also been working with Madaraka Nyereri from the, the JK Nyereri Library in Butiama and talking about how we might um, partner with them more on this. Um, but a lot of what I did, I said that the 2010 interviews with women, we hadn't put up because of the more personal nature of that. And so I went to each of the collaborators that I had worked with to try to show them who we had talked to and ask them and give them some support for going back to the places where we had done those region, those interviews to talk with the women or their families. Again, many of those have passed on and even, yeah, there's hardly any left from the 1995, 96 that I did. So that was a great joy to work with them. And, you know, overall, I was very worried about whether uh, those women would want this thing, you know, want this on an open access platform. And people were just like, of course we want it there. That's amazing. That's wonderful. So uh, I was kind of su uh, delightedly surprised to find that. Um, I visited a number of my research collaborators in the past who are, are doing all kinds of other things. I, I sort of did a rough count that, uh, you know, showing the website to at least 46 different groups of people or individuals um, as I went around to the different places search. And it was just a, a huge joy to be able to do that. Um, what, what was one surprising thing that came up is that a number of the people that had uh, kind of been my collaborators who had taken me to, to meet elders who would be willing to share the oral traditions, that they really got interested from working with me like this man, uh, Mayani Magoto in Nata, working with me since 1995. He is now interested in his own history and writing. So this is a notebook he was showing me of some things he was writing down and he wants to, you know, when he gets these ready, he wants to these to be typed up and he wants to share these and he's really excited about a way that he can share these things. And so many of those early collaborators are now known as, um, as local historians, as the older uh, people have passed on and they have, they're now holding a lot of this. So that was really gratifying to see how they had gotten involved as a result. Um, I also found that like, here's the Ecoma Culture and Heritage Development Group which published something on Ecoma history. So a number of kind of local historical associations, cultural associations, museum projects bubbling up that wanted to be uh, connected and wanted to, you know, we're so excited about this being available. Um, and, and again, it was, you know, I didn't get out my computer much. I just showed people on the smartphone and that's, that's what, um, largely what people will use to do this and they can download materials so they aren't using data all the time. Um, this is uh, Zedekio Losiso, who is this local popular historian who has uh, together, I, I took his work and edited it. And so we, and it's in Swahili and English. So he, we published this uh, a number of years ago called Grasp the Shield Firmly, The Journey is Hard, a history of Luo and Bantu migrations in North Mara, Tanzania. So he, that's his work and the, the tapes that he um, recorded since 1977, again, we're working with those and a lot of the, the things that he has put together. And he's now in his 80s and is just, you know, overwhelmingly uh, grateful and happy that this is actually happening now. Um, I, and as I went around, I, I, I met new collaborators. This is a group of 
uh, teachers from a local school who were really interested in how they could use it. I also visited people who I, who I had interviewed in the past um, who were really amazed to see their pictures and their interviews on there and, and had a great time thinking about that. Um, I also spent time visiting the, the Magoto family, who is this very large family in Nata that hosted us back in 95, 96 for the dissertation research. Um, the man down here in the corner who is now in his bed all day wrote a Nata dictionary and there he is with his uh, iPad and he's doing a, an update on that and wanted to make sure that I saw the update and that I would do something with this. So these are all people from that family who were deeply involved in the research from the beginning. Um, the Magoto family diaspora is now in Dar es Salaam, some of the older ones coming for medical treatment or other things. And so I visited them in Dar es Salaam and heard more about uh, some of the projects they are, are involved in now. And then um, finally, a whole bunch of new collaborators that I met in Dar es Salaam. Um, this, this woman, uh, here we are having lunch together in Dar es Salaam. And um, she found me, actually found me on the internet and found about my book. And then I shared with her about the Mara Cultural Heritage uh, site. And she's just pleased to death. She lives in Dar, but she, her family's back in Ngarime and she has uh, probably promoted this more than anyone else. And her husband had been in the Ministry of Education before retirement. And so they're, they're really uh, huge supporters. Uh, here's a young man, Emmanuel Kumari, who just came back from China, where he finished a degree in environmental studies and is passionate about history himself, and so really wants to, he, he is also one who's promoted this and um, is a huge supporter. And so people find it and get in touch with me and then do their own connecting with it. Um, we started uh, looking at the analytics about a week after the site actually went up. So I wish we had it a little bit earlier than that, but in any case, if you look back to June 14, when we started measuring it, uh, we've had 364 individual users. So even if they come back the second time, however that works, um, 289 of those access the site directly rather than through a search, which means probably they're getting it from stuff that we've sent out or these other collaborators have sent out, which is kind of interesting that the majority are ones who are directly know what site it is. Uh, 166 of those users are from Tanzania and that's particularly gratifying that um, people in Tanzania are using it. 160 from the US and other countries have like one to nine users each. 146 users are registered as Dar es Salaam, but I think that's questionable because it nothing shows up as a, a place in the Mar region, 14 in Mwanza, which is just south of the region. So I, I kind of think that 146 must be, yeah, I don't know how the Mara ones are being, uh, are, are coming up. So, you know, 364, I think for an academic site is not bad, but I would love to hear your uh, impact, uh, your input on that. So the future plans, we're gonna keep adding um, content and then really work on dissemination and going back to Tanzania, working to install a few computer sites in museums or libraries or places where people could have access near to schools. Um, but computer access remains a problem, like people can get it on their smartphones, but students, uh, well, maybe when they get to high school would have one, but younger students would probably not have access. Very elderly people probably don't have a smartphone. Um, I think probably smartphone is the future for it, but at this point, maybe a few access sites. Um, as we try to get some of this older material on, copyright issues are huge. Um, the East Africana Library and the Nyerere collection are also 
you know, wondering about copyright issues to, to put some of their things on there. I hope that um, we can continue to think about how we can generate local histories and, and keep posting those and put those up and see how that works and to support initiatives coming out of MARA for uh, what they might like to see on there. And I guess the big thing that I'm still thinking of and is yet unknown is what are the long-term implications of the digital return of this kind of material? What, what does this do to oral memory? I mean, that's kind of been one of my areas is thinking about memory, cultural memory, oral memory. So what happens when you have these, um, yeah, the, these sites where it is, it is in a sense frozen in time? I did have some uh, on WhatsApp, a back and forth from the woman in Dar es Salaam who said, oh, these Ingarime people on a WhatsApp, they have their own WhatsApp group. She said, they're fighting about this particular point in Ingarime history. And she said, I told them, just go to the website and you can find your answers there. So yeah, the question would be, um, yeah, so how, what happens when there's an authoritative site to go to and what does that mean for oral memory in the future? So I will um, stop sharing now and I would love to hear more from you and um, yeah, talk to you about what you saw. Hey, there's Thank Terry, you. hi. <laughs> A really interesting presentation. Yeah, so we can just start the discussion now since we're only a few people. I think I'll just allow anyone to unmute if they um, want to. Um, you can also put your question in the chat module and please remember that everything is being recorded. So um, your uh, questions will be part of the uh, recording and placed on YouTube. Um, if I may, I would like to start with a question of my own. Um, it's a really interesting project, really exciting to hear about it. Um, I was wondering about the website and um, how actively speakers can engage with it and contribute to it. So if, if they think, oh, I might have data of my own, which I would like to upload, is there a, a, a part of the website which is dedicated to this, so more citizen science, or would they have to approach you or someone else in the project to get it uploaded? Yes, at this point, and, and we might, um we might change that. But at this point, there, there is a, there's a place on the about page at the bottom, which says, if you wanna contribute anything or you have comments or questions, here's where you get in touch. And so then that goes on to a Google form that, that comes to me and then I respond directly. And I've had a few that way. And actually some really um, lovely things. And I've had a few people who have, when I was actually when I was there who asked about posting things. And so yeah, at this point they have to they have to come through me. And I think once we get everything in place, um, it would be nice if we could do something that's more open access to be able to post things. But right now, um, yeah, I'm the arbiter of that. Hi, Jan. Hey, hi. Hey, it's nice to see you after about 25 years. Exactly. Yes, wonderful to see you. <laughs> I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say that um, it's really exciting to see what you've done here. And it's so, so well done. It's amazing. Um, I'm sitting on some oral interviews from my work in Uganda, and this provides an example for me to sort of see what I could do with them in the future. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, and you and also Johnny, who have, you know, much closer connection to the Mara region. Like if I would love to have your feedback as you look through it and kind of see what's there. Um, so yes. I'm, I'm glad that both of you are here. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will look through all of it and, and give you some feedback. Yeah, uh, and I will say the whole website design that Michigan State did. I'm not responsible for the design and I'm just, they were really wonderful to work with. I had Catherine Foley was my direct connection. She trained my assistants. She was very responsive. She worked through the metadata stuff with me. It was very, you know, they were just wonderful to work with, I'll say. 
Yeah, that's great. It looks fantastic. So Bonnie Sands asks in the chat, what as a historian do you wish that linguists would do? What, what I'm interested in as a historian is that so many people who, you know, that I work with in Tanzania are just as much interested in language preservation as anything. Like they are really passionate about that and that their children would know the language and that there would be a place where, like in some of these interviews, that they vary on how much Swahili is in it, but um, many of them, um, there's a, you know, that when you're telling oral tradition, you're using some of the older terminology, the, the, the deeper kind of um, terminology. So people are really thrilled about that. Um, when you say, what do you, what historians wish linguists would do? And I think, I mean, I've worked with uh, historical linguists in all of my research and I've just appreciated so much what linguists can tell us, uh, tell historians about all kinds of things um, through linguistics and, and just in that preservation aspect. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And, and Bonnie, if you, if you are, if you're, connection is good enough. Can you tell me what your research is or what your work is? I, I do historical linguistics, but I also do language documentation. I basically work on all of the, the uh, click languages in Africa and have been working in the Kalahari more recently, although I did my original field work with the Hadza Bay. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, Andrew has a question in the chat because his internet connection is not great. I think he's in Tanzania now. Um, he said, I don't know if you talked about computer stations and MAR in your talk, uh, but I'm interested to learn more about these. Have you started setting these up? What do they look like or what do you hope? And though that was to be in the second year of the grant. So we kind of got some ideas when, when I was there, but we haven't started setting them up. Um, the grant only has like four or five places to set it up. So um, the Nyerere Library Museum in Butiama would be one place to put that. Um, I have a connection in Ingarime and Kemgesi, which is again, close to a secondary school. And they're putting together their own community center, which would have a museum aspect and they, uh, and some books, library. And they envisioned having a, com a computer center there. Um, there's another small emerging museum in Mugumu. So I think what, you know, I'm just sort of seeing how these come up organically. And I envisioned that we would have a simple desktop system in place, uh, I think by the, by the, the setup in Mwanza, probably not do the whole importing thing because yeah computers are available now um most places now have electricity which is different and wonderful so i think we we won't have to think about solar and all of that but a very just a very simple computer station that um students and other people could have access and hopefully have a person there who knows knows the library and you know, would be able to, to help people get on and browse and find what they wanted. So we kind of saw those as a place where students and other people who wouldn't have maybe as much facility to be able to, to use it. And again, I don't know how much of that is going to be like outdated and that it's going to go entirely on phones in the future. But it seems like having around museums and libraries, having some access is probably a good idea. Thanks, Andrew. I want to say again and echo of what other people have said, but thanks so much for all your hard work on this. I'm excited to look into it a bit more and um, see what all is on the site. Uh, I did have a specific question and maybe it's more starting a conversation with you about this, but I'm involved with uh, dictionary development in the Mara languages and um, I was very interested to see you 
uh, mention that here you mentioned that man, uh, the Nata man who has already worked hard on his dictionary because we're actually looking, hoping to find funding for a Nata Ikoma dictionary um, mm -hmm. in the near future. And so I was just wondering maybe if there's a way to incorporate the work that he's done in that dictionary would be great. So um, yeah, I just wanna think with you if there would be some possibilities for that, if you think he would be open um, for that possibility as well, so. Yeah, um, and the one, the Nata dictionary that the first one he did that is up right now was transcribed from his handwriting typed by one of my students who doesn't know Nata and doesn't know Swahili and was just trying to type exactly what she was seeing, which is a really hard thing to do. Um, and so she made some mistakes, which he's very annoyed about. Um, so I think that's why he's doing 2.0 and add, adding more words, but also correcting some of the mistakes in it. So I'll just give you that heads up in, in what we have there. I know that he thinks that it has a bunch of mistakes, but he, you know, he's quite elderly and frail. Um, his son is the one who's uh, going to give me access to his 2.0 when it comes out uh, to put up. Um, so yeah, either through him directly or through his son, I think we can, we can work out like how that might happen. And I think he, I mean, he was just thrilled to see that his first one was there and that, you know, that we had preserved that. So that was really exciting. And there are, I mean, there were people like this Ingarime chat group is working on their dictionary. So through the person that I know, like if you wanna get in contact with that WhatsApp Ingarime dictionary group, that would be kind of fun to work with them. So I know there's a bunch like, people really, that's the one thing they really want to preserve is words. Um, so yeah, I would love to work with you on that. And, and on what I have on there are also just word lists that I collected and other people, you know, there's a bunch of linguistic material on there. I had another question. I typed it in the chat in case I cut off, but uh, both for Jan and Johnny, have you run into this issue that I've run into that the, well, often when you get a Kiswahili translation, it's not the dictionary Kisanifu translation compared to English. And uh, so this, this has happened in a dictionary I worked on and been working on in South Africa where we actually have uh, non-standard translations marked as well as standard ones as marking part of the dialect diversity. You know, it's not just the uh, Ekinata that's important, but the uh, local variety of Swahili, so. Johnny, do you wanna to respond to that or? Well, just to say, yes, I've, I've definitely seen that. Um, and I think it is important for sure to, to preserve the translations that are coming across. Um, However, if you do want to make it more accessible to a wider Swahili audience, then probably including a more general translation as well um, would be helpful. So having both of those, and like you said, making a, a note of the differences would, would probably be helpful yeah. for that. And I would say we have, um, like in everything we're doing, uh, Tim Roth has been, he he's hasn't done a lot so far, but he's been kind of helping us and advising us on the linguistic aspects. Lots of the transcription in whatever languages were done starting in 95, like when I was still in Nata and by a young woman who was a secondary school leaver who wasn't trained in, you know, orthography or anything. So, you know, Tim and I are trying to kind of sort out, like it's not a standard orthography, so, but it's up there. And do we go back and try to standardize it in some way, <laughs> which would be a huge task because a lot of those transcripts, I mean, we're still working on transcription. Not all of them are transcribed, but um, yeah, what do you what do you do with all of that? That's a more a transcription issue, but um, 
Yeah, and so far for for other people who've put up their own dictionaries, I'm just putting them up without really, and I haven't really got much feedback on them yet. So we'll see. I did, um, since uh, both Terry and, um, and Johnny are here, I wondered whether the SIL um, materials that have been collected in Mara region, whether there's a way to make a link on the Mara cultural heritage with, I don't know what, in what form do you have your things and, you know, should we be linking those back and forth? Yeah, I think we should uh, definitely talk and, and figure out some, some good ways to, to move forward because it would be great if we can make things accessible as much as possible in one place um, rather than spreading them out. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think I, that you have done some kind of, you know, basic stories in different languages that I think people who go on the Mara Cultural Heritage site would love to see. So like if we can, like that resources place on the website, I thought that might be a place where, you know, other links to other websites or other kinds of resources could also be. So we could talk about how that might happen. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, that's a bit more practical questions, if I may. Um, so you talked a little bit about copyright concerns with some of the materials which you might want to get in. Um, mm -hmm. How does it work with informed consent when it comes to the interviews that you've done in the past? Yeah, that, that was an issue I had to solve in just in writing writing the grant because NEH would want to know that my materials were available. And so, um, yeah, when, when I did like particularly the 95, 96, but any of the interviews, people agreed to have me use them in the way that I was using them in my publications, but they didn't agree, you know, to have it be open access on the internet. So whatever was done before was not was not really um, viable anymore. So what I, in each place that I did interviews, I always had a collaborator there who would be the one to take me, introduce me to people. So I wrote back to those collaborators, gave them the list of all the people that we had interviewed, where we had interviewed them, the date we had interviewed. And then they went out and talked to people and basically got signatures. Um, we had a little, a little paragraph or two that said what they were agreeing to. And in many cases, so that would have been in 2019 and 20 when we were doing that, that, I mean, by that time, many, many of the people that I interviewed in 95, 96 were, had passed on. So it was often their families or it was, you know, someone else who, who signed on their behalf. Um, and I guess I am, I mean, in terms of the interviews, I thought there would be a whole lot more resistance. I mean, in fact, I've gotten no resistance that people are just thrilled. I thought I might get people to say, well, you know, you, you need to pay me for this, or you need to, I don't know, like you need to redact some things, but just haven't gotten anything. Um, the copyright is more for published things or formally published things like uh, the East Africana library director from University of Dar es Salaam said, wow, you know, I, you know, even things like theses, there, there are a number of master's theses at the University of Dar es Salaam on the Mar region, which are great historical studies, and that would be a interesting way to get those out in people's hands. But he said, you know, I know that the university has copyright. So he said, I have to go and sort through that and figure that out. Uh, the same with y the Nyerere collection. There are things in the Nyerere collection that are much more about the Mar region because that's where Nyerere was from that are, I mean, somewhat about him, but are sort of more Zanaki history or something else. And he also was not sure what kind of 
things they would have to follow. So in both those cases, they said, maybe we would give you a list of sources related to the Mara region in our collections that people could look at and then they could get in touch with us and see if we could share those or they could come and see them. So it's that kind of thing. Um, and then we're going, this fall, we're gonna start getting in touch with some of the presses who did some of that early, you know, East Africa Literature Bureau stuff, which was local histories, mostly in Swahili that are way out of print and whether they are open to having those be open access now. Great, thank you. Yeah, really interesting. I work in digitization of uh, also uh, linguistic interviews, but in Italy, and we are also running into the issue that you need to go back and ask informed consent because it was never conceptualized this way in the beginning. And it's, uh, yeah. it's a real issue, particularly when people have passed on and uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, also, I have another question, which is about more the long-term future of the platform. Um, so this is a three-year grant. Um, what will happen afterwards with digital infrastructure specifically? Well, that is the, the really critical thing of having um, Michigan State through the Matrix project. So they have a, they have a whole center for uh, the digital humanities there. And so their commitment is to, to host it indefinitely and to keep updating it and to keep keep it um, fresh and have it be part of the Africa Online Digital Library. So people could also come across it in that way if they just want to see what kind of oral sources are available for, for Africa. And, and the nice thing about it is even after the grant is done, I will continue to have access to Cora, so the, the thing in the background. And so I can add new material, I can take things off, I can, if some, like if a family would contact me and say, no, that has to go off the internet, it's, you know, it's damaging to our family, I can, you know, with a checkbox, I can have it go invisible, I can add it, I, you know, so I think, you know, sort of, as, as long as I'm around in my retirement, I can play with this, which is really uh, fun to think about is having time to really work on some of that and I can add to it. So that is the, the you know, when I was thinking about having this as just at a local server at small little Goshen College, it was obvious we, we don't have the capability to, to keep that kind of a collection going forever and and they're updating every night and they're like yeah they they just have a wonderful infrastructure for it yeah awesome yeah it's so important to have the yeah the long-term solution for the data archiving as well it's great to hear yeah yeah yep okay um so thank you for everyone who participated in the discussion I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page. Any entries of each presentation are added to the bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on September the 21st uh, and will be presented by Harold Hammerström. And it's titled The State of Description of the Languages of the World with a focus on Africa and the Rift Valley. Okay. So with that, I'd like to thank Jen again for her presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.